Sam Heiner is a student entrepreneur and a youth advocate. He is co-founder and executive director at Young People's Alliance, a youth movement focused on student-led advocacy, working to mobilize young people to achieve electoral and policy outcomes. Sam has advocated for youth issues on Capitol Hill at the North Carolina legislature and across 11 college campuses. His work, writing novel data privacy legislation, addressing manipulative social media algorithms led to advocacy that resulted in the bill's unanimous passage in the House Judiciary Committee. Sam has been featured in leading publications like Washington Post and People Magazine. Thanks so much, Sam, for your time today. Absolutely, thanks for having me. So my first question, we're gonna jump right into big tech, and I know that your group has been pretty critical of Meta. So Francis Hagen, which is, who is Meta's first whistleblower, testified before Congress that its products were harm, harming team mental health back in 2021. In 2023, Arturo Behar testified that Meta executives, including Zuckerberg himself, knew about harms to its youngest users, including unwanted sexual advances, discrimination, and self-esteem, but they chose not to make meaningful changes to address them. So my question to you is, what are some of the key harms um, that social media poses to young people, and what has big tech done to address those? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think it oftentimes looks different for everyone. Um, you know, social media can provide a lot of benefits for people in terms of being able to connect with each other and learn about different things. But at the same time, these platforms are not designed to make you as happy and fulfilled as possible. They're designed to keep you online scrolling for as long as possible so that they can sell you more ads. And they've got incredibly smart people designing machine learning algorithms that will do that at any cost. So if that means showing you content that makes you insecure, angry, sad, whatever it is, if it's going to keep you scrolling, that's what you're going to see. Um, and really, I think a lot of what it boils down to is that hatred, whether that's self-hatred, you know, is shown through things like content that's promoting eating disorders or other types of uh, insecurity, especially around the body is very common for social media. Um, or if it's hatred of other groups, we're seeing a lot of political extremist content as well online um, that can be really appealing to somebody. Um, you know, and I think that's that's a big common denominator of a lot of that. And it really shifts people's worldview because the average teen is spending over eight hours a day online. So if that's most of what they're seeing is this extremely biased content that the algorithm is feeding them to keep them online, then that's going to become their new reality. Yeah. So you talked a lot about content harm and you talked about negative bias, which um, one of our mental health experts talked about this idea that negative feelings actually linger longer. I don't know if you've heard this. So there's there's that part of it too, but also that sadly, because of the way these machine learning systems work, a lot of that content tends to rise to the top. You know, people are engaging uh, typically, sadly, with content where they're arguing, right? More so than with content that is just nice, right? And healthy or whatever else. So um, I'm so glad you brought those that up, as well as the time. You mentioned eight hours. Uh, according to the latest statistics, it is five of those is social media for teens. So yeah, it's a large amount of your time that you're spending in these machine learning platforms. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about teens. So the 13 plus age rating for social media is based solely on the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. This is from 1998. And mm. this prohibits companies from collecting personal information from children. So that's it. That's the, the one reason for that act. Uh, yet, according to an in internal report, Meta has 4 million underage users. And then according to Common Sense Media, almost 40% of children ages 8 to 12 use social media. So what advice would you give to kids and teens that are getting onto social media right now? Yeah. And I mean, that was me. I was on social media at, I think, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, the problem is these companies are saying that they're putting these filters in place and trying to do different things. But at the end of the day, we're digital natives. My generation is. And we find ways to get around those filters. Um, so that's why we really be need to be looking at how we're changing the design features and the way that negative content is almost forced upon us rather than saying we're going to filter certain things out. Um, when I was 11, 12 years old, I think it would have been very difficult for me to understand how 
just looking at content online could be harmful to me. Um, and I think, you know, it's opening up a whole new domain where now we've sort of got, we have to start talking to our preteen kids about things like eating disorders, things like political extremism, uh, and how do you maintain a balanced social media diet for yourself. But I think it is really important to understand that, you know, you can't treat them as if they don't understand what's happening and as if, you know, social media is this dangerous, scary place where nothing good happens. I think there needs to be a balance of saying, hey, you know, you're spending time online. What are you doing there? How is that contributing to you and who you want to be? What's enjoyable about it? And then maybe saying, oh, you're spending, you spent a lot of time online today. Like, what were you looking at and facilitating those conversations uh, between parents and kids, I think will be helpful. And then especially for those kids themselves asking like, what am I looking at? Is that making me feel unhappy? And is that why I'm continuing to scroll? And then especially if it is making you feel that way, is that really adding to your life? And is that a reflection of reality? Because it, oftentimes what you're seeing online is not going to be a reflection of reality. There's a couple things you brought up that I wanted to ask you about again to touch back on. One is you talked about young kids being able to get around whatever it is, right? The controls, the safeguards, whatever. Um, I think that's so important for parents to understand because I think they think, okay, I'm going to give my kid an iPhone. I'm going to put the, the parent controls on, but I don't think that they realize that without what you said, which is almost like a daily conversation and check-in that they're going to go on it, whether they find ways around to go on it on their own device or whether they're looking at other kids' device, right? So it's this ongoing dialogue that things to ha that needs to happen. And, you know, just, and I think you know this, but from the parents' perspective, it's incredibly overwhelming, especially since the next generation up, like my generation didn't grow up with this at all. And I'm in the tech industry and I'm an early adopter of all of this stuff. So I know about it, but even as a person that is so well-versed in this, I find it overwhelming. My son's 11 to even begin to, he knows about a lot of these things we're talking about, but even begin to start to monitor any type of online activity that has we, that he's, he's potentially going to do. We've held off um, personally, just because of my background and everything else. Um, but I think the fact that you touched on kids know how to get around it is so important because we do mention that a lot, but I don't think parents understand how smart yeah. these young kids are in so many ways. And, and then the other thing that, yeah. unfortunately, Go that ahead. is not giving you the tools you need to be able to have a positive relationship with social media anyways, either those parental controls or for your kids to be online in a healthy and safe way because they want to make money off of your kids. And so at the end of the day, yeah. they're not going to give the type of tools that we need to have the experiences that we want. Yeah. And then like one more quick follow-up question to that. You mentioned like kids 11 through 12 and kind of educating them on this and talking to them, talking to them about maybe how the content makes them feel or some of the pitfalls. But do you think at age 11 or 12, you were kind of qualified to self-regulate in that way? Like, even if you knew it was bad for you, could you put it down? Like given you knew that your friends were on it? Like, what do you think about that? I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think, you know, right now I have Instagram and I struggle to put it down sometimes. Um, yeah. And obviously I'm a lot more informed now about what those harms are, but you know, that I know people in my life who still maybe don't have all that information um, or experience trying to self-regulate and it's still an issue. And so I think we can recognize that younger people are going to have less self-regulation as their brain's still developing, but also still put them in the driver's seat. Because I think if you create kind of a hostile relationship where you're saying you can't have this or we're limiting you in this way, the kid's going to see all the amazing stuff that is online that can be really valuable and really plugs them in with their peers and what's going on in the culture um, and be like, why is this taken, being taken away from me? But if it's more of a partnership, I think that makes a difference. I mean, something that stuck yeah. with me recently was reading about how, you know, throughout history, it's always been that your older people are teaching your younger people younger people how the world works but with mm -hmm. technology that's started to shift because this is one area where your younger people have more information so i think that's why it's got to be kind of a more collaborative model and say hey what are you getting out of this device because there's some good stuff there and how do we just make sure that is a positive experience rather than a negative experience yeah that's true and we really try to 
do that too, where we balance with any technology, there's going to be pros, there's going to be cons. It just happens to be, I think you'll agree with me with social media. It happens to be a little bit more on the con side, which is, which makes it really challenging. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so let's push on uh, d development a little bit more because you brought that up. So the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of brain that's responsible for making good choices and realizing consequences. So that doesn't fully form until about age 25. Um, Silicon Valley execs themselves limit their children's contact with tech, including even sending their kids to tech-free schools like Waldorf. So do you think modern screen tech like video games and social media is designed for the developing mind? You touched on this a tiny bit in the beginning. Um, and why do you think leaders in big tech limit these products for their own kids? Yeah, I mean, I think in a way it is designed for the developing mind in terms of it's designed to get maximum attention out of the developing right. mind, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And so that's, yeah, I think that's what we've got to keep in mind is that these companies are not, as much as they'll come out and say, oh, we're working on you, these different safety features, at the end of the day, their profit incentive is to keep you online for as long as possible. So even if they were able to eradicate all harmful content online, which they're not doing a very good job of, despite what they claim, um, it would still not be a good place to be because you would still be online for far longer than you want to be online. And that's what I think we really need to take away is like, you should, if I want to go on social media for five minutes, it shouldn't all of a sudden be like, oh, three hours has passed of me scrolling. How did that happen? I should be able to exercise control over my experience to uh, spend the amount of time in general I want to spend online and I shouldn't be pulled into an addictive haze like that. So um, to that point, I think that's that's an overall design feature that we've got to keep in mind, honestly, for everyone, but especially for you know, our younger people as well. Uh, since they've been quicker to adopt social media. I mean, you do see it with adults and Facebook as well. Um, but I think that's absolutely a good point. And then was the second question about why the tech CEOs are keeping their kids off social media? Yeah. Why do you think yeah. they're doing that? <laughs> yeah. And I think there, there's an interesting point about, um, you know, having tech in schools. Like I was right on the edge where up until sixth grade, nobody had a phone. And then all of a sudden in sixth grade, everybody has a phone. Um, Cause I was really at that flip point just with my specific age and got to see both ways of living. And I think honestly, most young people, if they really thought about it would prefer to have a growing up experience. Uh, at least once you get to my age, you know, once you're in that college age, you'd prefer if your growing up experience was without phones, because even though there's something in the moment that you might want to be able to see, you're just forming less meaningful connections with people the, when that phone is in front of you. And I think it's almost a prisoner's dilemma issue where if I'm in school, I would rather that nobody had a phone and we could all just genuinely communicate, but I'm still going to bring my phone because I want to uh, <laughs> be able to do both. I want to also keep up with what's going on online. So I think, um, you know, I think issues like how do we approach phones in schools is definitely a complicated issue, but I think there's a reason that those people are doing that. And I think for young people, like there is a demand for spaces where we can just exist without our phones, you know, constantly being pulling us back in. And I think that's why you're seeing people like me get involved in this movement uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I should have phrased the question. Do you think it's de designed with the developing mind's health in mind? Because you're absolutely right. Like there's actually evidence of these companies, like seeing that there's young people that are actually younger than they're supposed to be on it and actually making choices to make it more sticky for those, those yeah. users. So you're absolutely right about that. Um, one thing that you brought up that I think is super important is um, John Haidt, who is everywhere right now with the anxious generation. I don't know if he coined this, but he calls it a collective action problem, right? Like I can control my um, son's, you know, ability to get a phone or access to social media or whatever, but I can't control his entire entering sixth grade class, right? Um, and what they're doing, right? So, and then part two of that is what you said, which is actually young people would prefer to not have this stuff at all, some of it anyway, or at least have a respite from it. But I think, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but from what I was hearing you say is, um, 
you know, they, they want to, but they can't because everybody else is on it, right? So they don't want to be the one person that doesn't have access or doesn't understand the trends or, or whatever. So it's really, it's what makes this so challenging is this collective action problem, which I think is what you're getting at. And I think that's some of the work that you're trying, trying to do, right? When you talked about phone free spaces and things like that, where when we can come together as a group, um, it just makes a huge difference. Am I, am I hitting the right yeah, absolutely. And I mean, especially for people, you know, everybody has a different experience with social media, but especially for people who do experience the worst kinds of harms, such as uh, developing an eating disorder because of social media or having it being exacerbated because of social media. Um, when that happens, you really can't exist on social media anymore because of the ways that social media companies that kind of combined with the way that our culture in general already treats uh, body image, makes it really difficult to be on social media, but you kind of have to isolate yourself from your friends oftentimes then. Like on Instagram, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I wish I could just get rid of my explore page and only see my friends posts or just get yeah. rid of posts entirely and just have access to my DMs. Like I wanna get off, but I can't because that's where people are, um, right. that's where people are right now. Yeah, I mean, you know this, but you know, I've been a social media marketer since 2007. And when it started, it was what you're describing. It was a chronological grid. Every post was just in order. And at the time, it was just your friends because companies weren't on it yet. Brands were on it a little, but the ads were not what they are now. They're not, they weren't even in feed. So it was actually like the healthiest version that I can think of. Um, and then obviously in 2012, enter curation AI and meta going public and everything else where, where it shifted. But back to what you were saying a little bit before you were talking about this idea that it should be less addictive, right? Like that should be the default, especially for younger people um, and, and the safest, right? Like those intentional design decisions could make a huge difference. Um, and they've done this. They've done this in Europe. There was legislation passed pretty recently. So that actually brings me to my next question that I wanted to ask you about, which was about COSA. So um, why does Young People's Alliance endorse the Kids Online Safety Act, COSA? And what do you think this bill would do to help youth mental health if it was passed? Yeah, for sure. So uh, the main provision of the bill is a duty of care, saying that these social media companies do have a duty to design their platforms in a way that don't lead to the facilitation of mental health harms, specifically eating disorders and other harms as well. Um, and I think that will go a long way to not just saying, how do we fix social media right now, but whatever the next way they find of manipulating our attention. Um, creating a legal liability so that they're incentivized not to design that in a way that will keep us online for as long as possible and create mental health harms for us. So that's a big component. And you, know, when I think about that, I just imagine that what if we had um, software engineers at Meta who were working to say, how can we give people the best experience where, oh, we see that you're doom scrolling on content related to this insecurity that you have or something. Let's give you a reel about um, how you can overcome that or maybe how you can um, you know, practice mindfulness and wellness. Like if, if things like that started to get implemented, we see a huge difference. The only problem is then people would set down their phones once they have that moment of relief. Um, and a duty of care won't necessarily force them to be entirely thinking about how we create the best experience, but at the very least, it'll prevent them from uh, just absolutely abandoning their duty to design a platform that isn't going to cause a mental health crisis, which is what they've done uh right now and so that's that'll be a big step forward other than that it'll give a lot more options in terms of privacy and safety features especially for kids but for everybody as well uh and the one that we're most excited about with that is the ability to turn off or opt out of those algorithmic recommendations so that you could have a feed that is more based on what you want to see rather than what captures your attention for a second that maybe doesn't reflect the type of person you want to be but um, you know, it's something that you might do scroll about. Yeah, that's so important. And I think um, it, it doesn't also, wouldn't it also allow you to opt out of curation AI? I suppose that's what you're talking about in the last, that last point, right? Where you could, you could tell it what you want to see versus the AI doing it for you. Yep. That's exactly, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. 
does it allow you to, would it allow you to have a chronological grid or it doesn't go that far? So without, that's actually an interesting thing to get into. What is, what is your feed going to look like without algorithm recommendations? Um, yeah. In general, so it's saying that you, I, I think there is a strict, a explicit requirement in the bill for a chronological feed. Um, but I think one of the interesting thing you can get into there is like, okay, well, what does social media look like now? Obviously you're seeing more po posts from your friends and less from celebrities and influencers and maybe even people that you, you're never gonna see again, but who just made a reel that caused people to look at it for three seconds. Uh, and so the algorithm rewarded them for that. Um, yeah. That's also going to reward small businesses because they are going to benefit from a community based model where they have followers and loyal customers versus a large business that has an entire PR department that can help them design content that's going to be sticky in that way. Yeah. You know, it's funny you said the small businesses because, you know, I've, I've been with this a very long time. And every time, let's just use Instagram, for example, made a tweak to their algorithm that would favor like you said, bigger business influencers over, you know, people being able to just organically reach their customers. I remember there being an outcry each time. And um, it's, it's very, very hard as a small business or even um, people like us, right, that have a small nonprofit that maybe want to get our word out to do this because of the way the algorithms don't favor us to be able to even talk to our own audiences, right? Like they want us to pay for ads and then they want our, uh, audiences to stay on as long as possible by giving them this this content that you know might not be healthy or like you said is algorithmically algorithmic algorithmically favored right so um so that's really interesting it could it could definitely reverse some of those i think harms you know that were done to smaller businesses or individuals or people just looking to use it for the reasons that it could be positive, right? So um, I think that's an interesting part of it that you just brought up. Um, okay, so let's talk about the hearings from January. So in January of 2024, the CEOs of Meta, Snap, TikTok, Discord, and X went before the Senate Judiciary Committee to testify about the effects of social media on youth mental health and safety. Senator Blackburn cited internal documents that estimated the lifetime value of a 13-year-old user to be $270. Your group was there wearing those shirts that talked about you being your value being more than $270, which was awesome. Um, Senator Graham said that Zuckerberg had blood on his hands, quote unquote. Young People's Alliance, as I said, was there. You attended these hearings. So how did this hearing um, and how do hearing these testimonies make you feel as a young person? And how do you think the hearings, do you think they were a tipping point for this issue? Yeah, I think it was really validating to see. I mean, when I started this work, a lot of the people I talked to early on in politics had no idea what I was talking about. And I would just basically say, hey, you know how your kids on their phone all the time? We're trying to make social media less addictive. So that doesn't happen less. But there was no connection with like what was happening behind the screen. And I think we've yeah. seen, you know, thanks to a lot of organizations doing this work, we've seen a huge increase in the education of our lawmakers where we've got, we've still got clips circulating from that hearing a couple of years ago um, that Zuckerberg was at, which I think was more privacy oriented, but where there were a lot of uh, uninformed questions asked of Zuckerberg um, that got made fun of online for a while. This hearing uh, for the most part was a lot better in terms of when most senators came into that hearing, um, they really understood these harms, which was really cool to see that they had been having these conversations. I mean, there's you know, one or two examples that stick out that went viral online um, and maybe overshadow that in some ways, but that again shows how social media is kind of shifting that narrative towards the negative point that grabs your attention rather than the overall positive, which is that all these senators now understand this. So I think that was absolutely yeah. a huge point. We've seen a lot more optimism for the movement of Kids Online Safety Act since then. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I also agree that the hearings were more performative, right? Especially the sound bites that got pulled out, right? Where even the quote I read was so dramatic and, you know, the public apology obviously got a lot of play and things like that. But um, to your point, there was a lot of meat in there too, like going beyond every senator standing up 
with their their sound bite, right? Which mm-hmm. is what they do anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, do you th- do you think though, like that was just publicly at least? Do you think people? I, I I mean, I know a lot of people saw them, heard about it. Like, do you think that there was there's going to be some change coming just based on those hearings? Yeah, I think I think it's been it's been a long time of building, and I think that's we're we're starting to get to that like breaking point where it's uh, yeah. exponentially increasing, and that hearing was you know part of that curve where we really started to go up. Um, I think there's you know been a lot of events along the way, but absolutely, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if like historians point to that hearing as being the tipping yeah. point. Um, yeah, and I think especially among parents, that did a lot. I think the most powerful moment for me was when parents who had lost children um, in the audience held up their photos of yeah. their children um, and who had lost children due to things related to social media, that is. And so I think things like that, I think, have really resonated. I think with young people, there's still an education game to be done. Like, I'm glad that doom scrolling is a common term now and i feel like that really only hit the mainstream in the last couple of months uh it's been around for a while before that but i'm seeing it used a lot more and i'm like okay this is a tool that we can use to really explain these harms so i think i think we're getting there with young people as well which is really cool to see yeah i mean i think to your point the first step is always awareness like whether you know what to do about it or not is step two but at least being aware and self-aware is huge, you know, and understanding um, what's what's behind these platforms and how they work is just going to give you that, empower you that much more to make it what you want it to be, right? Instead of the other way around, right? Tech having control over you, you having control over the tech. So definitely awareness is, is a big part of it. So uh, you touched on this earlier, but uh, you mentioned you got your first phone in sixth grade, right? So, Mm -hmm. but what age were you when you first got onto social media and how do you think your childhood would have been different if you hadn't grown up with it? Yeah. So yeah, that was around that 11, 12 point. I think it was, I got Instagram on my iPod touch in fifth grade was what it was. And then, then got a phone in sixth grade. Um, And when I, like you alluded to earlier, when I first got Instagram, it was not like it is today. There wasn't, there was an explore page, but it was that Google, or I'm sorry, not Google. Meta hadn't figured out their machine learning yet. So it wasn't designed to manipulate you. Or maybe it was just that it hadn't, um, that wasn't their goal at the time. And they became more profit oriented later on. But either way, it was, you know, just kind of a part of my life, but not a big part of my life. Oh, I'm going to see what people are posting today. And that was about it. Um, and my childhood at that time in elementary school, um, was really filled with like playing outside with friends, uh, video games were still a big part of my childhood, but it would be like, oh, I'm going to go over to my friend's house and we're going to play video games versus sixth grade, way, way less in-person, um, interaction. And it was a lot more like, um, based around the internet and social media. So both social media, there's also... Uh, Skyping with friends and playing video games a lot more, which is, you know, a completely different conversation, which I think is honestly helpful because there still is that interaction um, versus social media where you're just scrolling and 90% of the time just looking at what somebody else is doing. Um, But kind of seeing that come in, I think, I think for me, I turned out okay. Um, But there were definitely some rough patches with like social media and, kind of getting sucked in and I definitely missed opportunities to spend time with other people to work on projects I cared about and other things because of social media. And at the time I felt like it was a personal failing. I was like, why can't I just get off social media and do all these things I want to do with my life? Uh, And I didn't understand at the time that it was designed to addict me and that this was a bigger problem than just myself when I talked to friends and heard even worse stories. And I think that's what scares me the most and really what when I first got into this in terms of advocacy, what really motivated me was um, I think for a lot of young people who struggle socially, it can be that crutch for them. Where It's like, OK, well, I can't engage with my peers, but I can go online and at least kind of simulate social interaction. And it's not good at all. I still feel lonely. I still feel terrible about myself. I might even feel worse about myself, but at least I don't feel completely isolated. It's just stringing me along just enough to where I don't feel like it's necessary maybe to build up the courage to go talk to somebody because I have an alternate activity. I can go online. And that is what really scares me about social media and about AI chatbots, I think are going to be the next frontier of that is 
uh, not that they exist, I think they play an important role, but that for many young people, they're becoming the alternative to in-person interaction and are making us just so much less well-equipped to form relationships with each other in person, making us much more lonely and anxious and sad. Yeah, there's so much there based on what you said. One thing that you said that was really important is that you would play video games together with your friends, right? Like in the same room and not to say that doing it on Skype isn't something, right? But when you talk to the experts in mental health, they all say the same thing, which is that um, anytime we can have a collective experience with technology, that's better than an individual experience, right? So when kids are very young, it's like they tell you, you know, watch the show with them, talk about what's happening, right? Like that's much more different, much different than having them, you know, alone in a room just doing it. And I get it. Like I'm a parent too. Like we all use it as a babysitter, especially when kids are younger. But I think the biggest, the most interesting thing about what you said is this idea that technology can bring us together. Right. Um, but more often than not, it's actually making us more isolated, which is very ironic, but that is, that is the reality. And again, I'll reference John Hay because he talks about the flip phone, right. Being something that millennials had and millennials actually have better mental health outcomes than even my generation. I'm gen X, right. Because the flip phones were bringing them together, they would do it to call each other. Um, or even, I mean, texting was difficult, but everything they were doing was about let's make plans to get together, right? Versus now, like, obviously, if you have a very um, healthy mental health situation, like I suppose it could be the same now, right? Where uh, you can get on it, get off of it, you're fine. But many people, and you you touched on this, are using it, I, I don't even know if you use this word, but almost as a crutch, right? For social interaction. And that's the part that gets um, scary, as you said, right? Because um, we're keeping people from having these collective experiences that are very, very healthy, you know, for us as humans, like we are still mammals, you know, we need to connect, we need to be together in person. So I think that's the most interesting part about what you said. And then you also touched on this idea of failure to launch. I don't know if you meant to, but uh, you talked about this idea of like, hey, I don't need to go I don't know, ask someone on a date or whatever it is, right? Because I have this technology that's keeping me busy and we can delve into that further as, as to what that means. But um, I agree, like to me, that is a very scary part of this, especially in young men. And I don't know if you can speak to this at all, this idea of failure to launch, but you know, a lot of those dots are being connected to things like porn, you know, and having that being accessible or, um, you know, this idea that, I, I can just swipe left or right. I can't remember which one it is, right? And I don't have to go be rejected in person. I don't know if you want to respond to that at all, but I I heard you touch on that a little bit in your last answer, the failure to launch idea. Yeah, yeah. I think it definitely does extend into the romantic area as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I think it's it's like social media. Like there's probably a place where technology can fit into our romantic lives as well, but it needs to be kind of as a side item to doing things in person. And I mean, like, like dating apps, for instance, uh, probably do have a place, you know, and can make connections that maybe wouldn't have happened otherwise. But at the same time, if you're using dating apps and you've lost your ability to go up to somebody in person, um, then that's that's a negative and you shouldn't be using dating apps in that case at least until you yeah. can regain that ability so i definitely think that um that it's all connected in that way and i think it's really yeah. really about finding you know social out of all the things that we've talked about i think social media is the one that's most designed to be addictive and has been most successful in just keeping people doing that one activity for wildly long amounts of time. And so that's why we're looking there to say, how can we regulate these design features? Um, but then I think we've personally, we've all got to look in all aspects of our lives and our technology use and say, hey, is this actually making me a better person or a worse person? Like, how am I coming yeah. out of this? Is this, you know, kind of enabling me to pave over maybe some flaws that I should be working on, like my ability to talk to people in person and build relationships with people and things like that. Yeah. Um, okay. So my last question is about 
some of the things you've talked about when it comes to like advocacy. So what can young people do to stand up to big tech and its addictive algorithms, which you've talked a lot about and its toxic features? What could, what can I do if I'm a young person? Yeah, I love that question. I think there's a lot of really good ways to get involved. Um, so with the Young People's Alliance, you can check us out at youngpeoplesalliance.org. Um, we're always looking for new people to join what we're doing here. We're doing a lot of direct advocacy to legislators. We have people going on Capitol Hill, knocking on doors and talking to um, elected officials and staffers about that. And we've been able to make a lot of progress through that. I think generally, like just talking about this stuff, both looking at your personal use and talking about it with friends uh, can make a really big difference. Um, and then we've got different groups out there. Like uh, prior to this call, you and I were talking about Sean from Reconnect. Um, mm -hmm. And there's clubs out there that are working on uh, creating spaces where you can exist without your phone. And maybe if that's not at your school yet, you should start one. Definitely uh, reach out mm -hmm. and we can give you the connect for people who have already been doing that work. But those are just some ideas. I mean, I think it's important that we do take action here. So really appreciate you asking that question. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for your time and everything you're doing. People like you, I think, uh, restore all of our faith in young people. It sounds corny coming from an older person, but um, but it's true. It's uh, I really, really appreciate everything you're doing to work with your own generation because it has to come from you guys. It can't come from from us, the older generation, right? So it's just really, really inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I really appreciate you giving me the space to talk about this as well. Thank you, Sam.